is Paul Rozier. I am the director of the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and a member of the Villanova History Department faculty. Welcome to the fourth of seven explorations of the LePage Center's year-long theme, Cities in Historical Perspective. A special welcome to our distinguished panelists, David Barnes, Cindy Ermas, and Andrew Wehrman. My Villanova History Department colleague, Julia Mansfield, will moderate this discussion on public health in, in port cities. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge Albert LePage's vision and generosity, which allowed us to establish the LePage Center in 2017. And I want to thank Kevin Fox and Alvin Wong for helping to organize tonight's event. Finally, I want to encourage you to attend the LePage Center's final event of the fall semester. On Tuesday, December 5th, we'll offer something a bit different, video games in historical perspective, which will explore how video games reflect the creative impulses of their historical period. The event will be moderated by Gordon Coonfield of Villanova's Communications Department. This event will be virtual, begin at 6 p.m., and require advanced registration. To register, please visit the LePage Center homepage. And please stay tuned for announcements of spring semester events, which will continue the theme of cities in historical perspective, as well as include special events on Ukraine, baseball in historical perspective, and other important and interesting topics. And now I'd like to introduce Julia Mansfield, who will then introduce our panelists. Dr. Mansfield is an assistant professor of history at Villanova, who specializes in early American history. Her scholarship centers on epidemics and public health in the 18th and 19th centuries, in particular, the impact of yellow fever epidemics and pandemics on American public health policy, economic development, and foreign relations. She has won awards and fellowships for her research from the Society for American Historians, the Omohundro Institute of Early American History and Society, and the Consortium for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. Some of Dr. Mansfield's research will appear in the forthcoming book, Port Cities of the Atlantic World, Sea Facing Histories of the US South, which will be published in December by the University of South Carolina Press. And two of our panelists are also contributors to that volume. Dr. Mansfield, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rozier. I'm delighted to be with you. And I wanna extend my own welcome to everyone who's joining us this evening for the next installment in the LePage Center's year-long exploration of cities in historical perspective. Cities have long been crossroads for people, commerce, and contagion. For that reason, cities have frequently also been the sites of epidemics and innovation in public health. Surveying the historical record, I could point to a dozen examples, but I'll limit myself to just two to set the scene. My first example is Venice, Italy. Historically, the nexus of maritime trade in the Mediterranean, Venice was a main crossroads in cultural and economic exchange between Asia and Europe, but that situation also made it vulnerable to the spread of bubonic plague. And in the late medieval period, Venice was hit repeatedly with epidemics of plague. From those crises arose innovation in public health. And in the 15th century, Venice became the first place to establish a board of health that administered quarantine for incoming ships. That established a model that was then emulated across Europe in the early modern period, and is the reason that the word quarantine has been absorbed into the English language. Jumping forward in time and drawing us closer to home, my second example is Philadelphia, which was once the largest city by population in the United States. After the American Revolution, Philadelphia was not only the political capital of the new nation, but also the major port of entry for immigrants and goods coming from the Caribbean. And this flow of commerce and people made the city vulnerable to another global epidemic, which was yellow fever. Recurring epidemics of yellow fever compelled Philadelphians to revise their public health laws and led to the establishment of a quarantine station below the city, along the Delaware River, at a site in which we can still have the longest standing quarantine station known as the Lazaretto, which one of our speakers has been involved in preserving and interpreting. So we can thank David Barnes to contributing to the preservation of that important 
historic site in the history of public health and the history of Philadelphia. With this history in mind, it's fitting that we have organized this panel on epidemics and public health as part of the LePage Center's year-long series on cities and historical perspective. And I'm delighted to be joined by three talented scholars who have all written uh, recently and published books on this subject. I'm gonna introduce all of them now and then invite each of them to give some prepared remarks before we have a question and answer session and general discussion. So our three speakers are Dr. Cindy Ermus, Dr. Andrew Rearman, and Dr. David Barnes. Let me begin with Dr. Cindy Ermus, who is Director of Medical Humanities and Assistant Professor of History at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She specializes in the history of medicine and the environment, especially epidemic diseases and disasters in 18th century France and the Atlantic world. She has recently published a book entitled The Great Plague Scare, of 1720, Disaster and Diplomacy in 18th Century Atlantic World, which was published by Cambridge University Press this year, 2023. Simultaneously, she also published a book on urban disasters with Cambridge University Press. Her next book, almost finished and co-authored with Claire Eddington, is a global history of epidemics from the Black Death to the present. Beyond her research, and teaching. She is co-founder and executive editor of the open access peer-reviewed publication, Age of Revolutions. One contributor to that publication is our next speaker, Dr. Andrew Weirman, who's an associate professor of history at Central Michigan University, where he teaches classes on early American history, the American Revolution, and the history of medicine. He's the author of The Contagion of Liberty, the Politics of Smallpox in the American Revolution, which came out last year, and since its publication has received a lot of attention and well-deserved awards. It was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award in the category of history. It was a winner of the Peter J. Gomes Memorial Book Prize from the Massachusetts Historical Society, and named one of the best books of the year, 2022, by the Harvard Public Health Magazine. Dr. Women is committed to bringing his scholarship to a wide public audience and has written articles for the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, and NBC News, and has recently been named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians. Our third speaker is Dr. David Barnes, who's Associate Professor of History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches courses on the history of medicine and public health. His early books focused on the history of public health and disease in 18th century France, specifically, or I should say 19th century France, specifically the history of tuberculosis and the bacteriological revolution. But more recently, he's turned his attention to Philadelphia and has published a book in this year entitled Lazaretto, how Philadelphia used an unpopular quarantine based on disputed science to accommodate immigrants and prevent epidemics. The book focuses on the Lazaretto site that is on the Delaware River in Tinicum Township, a site that Dr. Barnes has been very um, eagerly involved in preserving and interpreting. And if you live in the Philadelphia area, I encourage you to visit that historic site and use the audio guide that Dr. Barnes and graduate students at the University of Pennsylvania prepared to guide you through the site. It's really worth a visit. In recent years, Dr. Barnes has also taught and written about strategies for presenting history to the general public and the ways in which historical perspectives can guide efforts to confront disease today. As you can tell from these biographies, these scholars all bring their expertise to an important subject, which has become increasingly important given our experience with COVID-19 over the past few years. So I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. Cindy Ermis, and uh, during the presentation, I will invite our audience to contribute questions that we can then turn to to the general Q&A after all the speakers have their turn. So Dr. Ermis, I'll turn things over to you now. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansfield. I'm going to quickly share my screen, if I may. Set this up. Does that look all right? Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you for the invitation, of course, to 
uh, for to be a part of this. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank the LePage Center, of course, uh, at Villanova University, organizers, my fellow panelists, and of course, thank you, audience, for joining us on this uh, uh, Thursday before this holiday week coming up. Um, my book, and I'll go ahead and put this one up. Uh, my book looks at an epidemic of plague, a bubonic plague in particular, uh, that took place in 1720 in the south of France. Uh, I, it's the, the plague of Provence, uh, so which is to say the southeastern uh, part of France in 1720. Um, it's traditionally known as the Great Plague of Marseille, but as we'll see here in a moment, it's, uh, it affected much more than the port city of Marseille. And so I find that the title Plague of Provence, uh, which is referred to as the Plague of Provence in contemporary documents as well, uh, makes more sense, it's more fitting. Very briefly, uh, I'll stop for a second just to explain what plague is. Plague, the word plague is thrown around to refer to a number of things, including I've heard it used to refer to COVID, for example, um, uh, and so on. So this particular disease uh, is caused by a bacteria called Yersinia pestis discovered in the late 19th century during the third plague pandemic that unfolded uh, mostly uh, in China. Um, and it is, uh, but it results in, you know, it's with the fever, the, the typical, the symptoms are quite typical with fever and, uh, and body aches and everything else, except that you have the telltale signs, the signs of contagion, as they're referred to in a lot of contemporary documents, which is to say uh, the buboes, these uh, growths at the lymph nodes. So it could be at the neck, in the underarms, and in the groin, for example, that could grow or wax, as they said, to the size of an apple or an orange or a lemon, extraordinarily painful, uh, as well as the symptom that gives the black death, if you've heard of that, its name, and that is acral necrosis, to where your uh, fingers and our extremities uh, decay. Uh, basically, they they die. <laughs> so um, very, very unpleasant condition uh, and uh, and extraordinarily destructive in 1720. I should mention, too, that this was one of the this was basically the the last of the major outbreaks of bubonic plague in Western Europe. There would be another one uh, some 20 years later that was much smaller, and that was in Messina in Italy and Sicily. But for the most part, this was a big final hurrah in Western Europe after many, 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 many decades and centuries of recurrent plague outbreaks that began with the uh, Black Death in the middle of the 14th century. And so this is where it arrived in 1720. Uh, as the story goes, it arrived on a ship called the Grand Saint Antoine that uh, arrived uh, back to Marseille after spending a year amassing cargoes of rich silks and, and items for a, an annual fair that took place uh, in the south of France in a town called Beaucaire. And um, there's now conversations between geneticists and historians. You know, there's a possibility that maybe the outbreak could have come from an animal reservoir within Europe, but uh, all of the contemporary documentation, all of the historical documents that I've encountered across uh, across the Atlantic Ocean really seem to agree that it arrived on this ship in 1720. In two years, perhaps uh, as many as 126,000 people perished. And that's out of a population of roughly in the region of Provence, 600,000. These numbers are always rough estimates, of course, as you probably all know. Um, but nevertheless, it took it was a it was a, a significant outbreak of plague uh, over these two years. But it's also important to note that it remained within Provence for the most part, with some exceptions would be only uh, some cases in neighboring provinces like Languedoc, for example. But for the most part, it remained within Provence. And so for many, many decades uh, after, it was seen as a, a great success in terms of uh, its management. But I don't look at what happened in uh, France, or certainly not just what happened in France. That's chapter one. <laughs> Every other chapter in the book uh, looks at a different part of uh, Europe and the world, really, including uh, the Italian city-states, for example, Genoa and Venice, which Dr. Mansfield just mentioned, as well as the port city of London, 
uh, Spain as well, with a focus on the port city of Cadiz in the Atlantic, Atlantic port city there, as well as a chapter on the uh, Spanish and French colonies, which focus on some particular centers or hubs there as well. And the idea was exactly that, to, to these, to, uh, which it's the word I'm looking for, to, um, to look beyond the, the, the seat of infection, as it were, uh, and follow the trail, follow the tracks, the evidence of ramifications outside of France to see how this event that remained, it did remain you know, within southern France, but how did it affect neighboring regions and how did it affect uh, regions as far away as the Atlantic colonies? Uh, and really the Pacific colonies, if you look at Manila, Philippines, which was Spanish at the time. And that's what I did. I began my research in, in Paris, France, thinking that this was going to be a case study of different disasters of the 18th century, see what kind of questions emerged. And when I got to the archives there, it turns out that uh, everything that everybody was talking about for this period of time was the Marseille Plague in 1720. I decided this is I have too much good stuff here. I need to write the book on just the 1720 plague. And, and here we are. And so I follow its ramifications in these neighboring regions, how authorities in France, in the Italian city-states, in Great Britain, in Spain, uh, and of course in the colonies, as I said, managed the crisis. Fundamentally, that is the, uh, the main uh, argument and uh, the main uh, point of the book. Uh, coming to this topic as a historian of disasters and crisis, I was interested not only in the impact of historical disasters in their own time, but how they have informed how we both understand and manage them today. And so my main argument is that the plague of Provence represented an important formative moment in what I call disaster centralism, uh, by which I mean the centralization of disaster management. Crisis was previously handled locally, at the regional level, at best, at the municipal level, more often than not, uh, which is to say at the city level. That begins to change by the early 18th century, and this particular crisis marks a significant moment in that shift, in that, uh, in that history. What we start to see, particularly here uh, in 1720, is that it is now being managed, this particular crisis is managed from the capitals of Europe's emerging nation states. Not only Paris, where the regent uh, was situated at the time, but even in neighboring regions to protect themselves from plague, these monarchs, these individuals in Madrid, in London, and along in, in for example, uh, different part, just different city states, uh, which is a, a kind of a unique situation with the Italian city-states in itself in some ways. But nevertheless, um, they deploy royal representatives and or agents, depending on where you look, to infected areas. They're charged, these agents are charged with reporting back to the crown uh, or to the capitals with about what's going on. We see increased communication between the capital, therefore, and the, the head of states uh, or the, the, the heads of the provinces. There's increased surveillance on the ground, especially along borders and along coasts, of course. Uh, this allowed also simultaneously for the clamping down on smuggling that we see temporarily, of course, at this time. Uh, we see being uh, controlled from the capitals, uh, control of movement rather, is now being managed rather from the capitals. Uh, this includes the use of health certificates, health passports, um, directions for quarantines, how to carry them out as well as the organization of quarantine lines or cordon sanitaires. These are uh, sanitary lines that were literally lines of soldiers many, many feet apart, armed to the teeth in order to shoot uh, immediately anybody who tried to cross the lines out of their regions or out of their city, whatever, wherever, uh, whatever the case may be. Trade embargoes. Uh, now we start to see you know, more vessel searches, controversial vessel searches. So there is a lot going on now, and it's now being controlled from the capitals for the most part. Uh, and that's not to say that there was nothing going on at the local level in terms of managing the crisis, of course. Um, but it is to say that the that these cap these far flung capitals were more involved than ever before, right? So, so the plague of Provence sees uh, also some of the earliest appearances of centralized boroughs of health, 
in the case of Paris, for example, the Conseil de la Santé, uh, and in Madrid, the uh, Junta Suprema de la Sanidad, uh, the Supreme Committee of Public Health. These are both founded in 1720. Um, and if you follow, for example, with the Junta Suprema de Sanidad founded in 1720 in response to this plague crisis in, in Madrid, it's actually evolved through the years to today's Ministerio de Sanidad, right, the Ministry of Health. And so what we see is that this crisis was used as a means to centralize power, the power of the crown, in the case of Spain, to use them as an example, to improve their place in the balance of Europe in terms of trade, um, in which they had been in a disadvantage for some time by this point. That's not to say that there was a steady, a steady incline uh, from 1720 to today in terms of an increase in centralization or in the decentralization of disaster management in particular. There have been fits and starts uh, and it has varied by time and place. There has been the pendulum swing towards centralization, decentralization when you look specifically at disaster management, but this was the beginning in many ways of what we recognize today as disaster management. When disaster strikes here in the United States, people look to quite literally the president, they'll look to FEMA, they'll look to the CDC and see what any, you know, what is being done about it and uh, uh, and what uh, who's going to clean up the mess. And so this is a, a sort of early chapter of that history. Um, in terms of research, uh, I did this research uh, beginning in France and I pretty much followed the paper trail. Uh, so I ended up going to different, about 20 different archives and libraries in Europe, a few here in the United States, looking mostly at consular papers, uh, correspondence of public health officials uh, and heads of state uh, and representatives, uh, ecclesiastical authorities and sermons, uh, family papers were very useful, uh, of course, newspapers and even contemporary images. And, uh, and this is the, uh, the product here. Thank you very much. Dr. Weirman. Yeah, it looks like I'm, I'm yeah, next. Yeah, you're next uh, up. <laughs> thanks also to you, uh, Julia, and the, and the LePage Center. Let me get, I've got some uh, slides too. Let me get them set up. All right, and thanks for that uh, introduction. You know about my, my book already, but there it is. There's the the, the cover and the title and maybe what I think the thesis is today. It kind of changes sometimes when I when I think about different things. Um, but I wrote this book. It, it was published almost um, a year ago. It's been out, I don't know, 11 months or something. Uh, but the research and the writing for it uh, was predominantly done well before COVID. I was writing the, the final draft to send to my editor and to send to reviewers, though, uh, in 2020, in the in the spring of 2020, and I suddenly re realized that this topic um, wasn't as esoteric, maybe as I thought it might be. That that now everyone in the world has experienced um, the quarantines and the emotions involved in in epidemic and loss and grief and anger. Um, but my book itself uh, is centered on the 18th century. It doesn't have anything to do with with uh, COVID, uh, at least not directly. Uh, uh, the, the book argues that demand for public solutions during uh, smallpox epidemics, especially for broad access to inoculation against smallpox, that it infected revolutionary politics. It made everyone uh, angrier and have increased demands of what kind of government they wanted. It changed the way ordinary Americans understood their health and uh, their government's responsibilities to protect it. It's governments with the S or with the apostrophe after the S because it's local uh, colonial state governments and then, and then national governments. Uh, the book uh, essentially begins with the introduction of inoculation in colonial America by the African slave Onesimus, a remarkable story about how uh, this uh, uh, technique to prevent smallpox inoculation was introduced by an African slave and then of course became uh, uh, the most demanded medical procedure of the 18th century. And it really, especially in the United States or what becomes the United States has this crescendo during the American revolution as uh, Americans 
demand access to inoculation. George Washington famously inoculated the Continental Army in 1777, but the book moves past the war and talks about the early Republic as well as the introduction of vaccination later on. Uh, but when Julia invited me to be here and asked me to uh, talk a little bit about, in part, um, the relationship between uh, my book, the politics of, of health, past and the present, it made me think of, of, of this guy. I don't know if you remember, um, not too far from, from here, I'm in uh, central Michigan, just uh, down the road a little ways is Lansing, Michigan, where in uh, April 2020, there was an armed protest, kind of an in, almost an insurrection, kind of a, a precursor to January 6th in, in D.C., in which armed protesters took over the Michigan State Capitol. Uh, this was, was called the American Patriot Rally and was organized by a group called Michigan United for Liberty. And as a person who was writing a history of the American Revolution, with the title, The Contagion of Liberty, seeing liberty being uh, sort of co-opted and used this way and seeing patriotism being used this way. Uh, well, one, I, I suppose the nice way to say it is it kind of crystallized the argument of my book at the same time as making me kind of furious um, because the protesters in Lansing were carrying signs equating public health, governors making uh, uh, public health ordinances, uh, uh, closures of, of businesses, places where people congregate, calling them tyrants and saying that freedom was a lack of public health laws, right? And, and especially, uh, you might have seen this in, in your uh, neighborhoods as well, um, this don't tread on me flag became very popular, uh, the Gadsden flag. Uh, with the with the rattlesnake, right? With the insinuation that liberty means uh, the government doing nothing uh, during a crisis, right? Not treading on any what what any one individual citizen wants to do, and this was infuriating uh, uh, to me. Um, and it has nothing to do with what the American Revolution or, or revolutionaries thought. And so much of this was kind of steeped in rhetoric from the revolution, people carrying Betsy Ross flags and, and things. Um, just as a, as, a, as a point of fact, and this is just flies by if you read the book, it's just like one paragraph in, in my book, but I like to point it out. Um, Christopher Gadsden, uh, the, the man who designed this flag, which went on to become an uh, insignia of the uh, Navy, uh, during the revolution. Um, he himself was a smallpox commissioner in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, as uh, Cindy has already walked you through, uh, local governments, city governments established uh, quarantine protocols during, during epidemics. Charleston, South Carolina was no different. Um, Gadsden was a smallpox commissioner, which meant that it was his job to collect weekly and, and publish weekly reports on a number of infections of smallpox. It was a citizen's duty to report if they were sick, um, if, if they did not report their, their symptoms to their elected officials, they could have heavy fines. Um, of course, if it was a confirmed infection of smallpox, uh, the person would be forcibly uh, quarantines. And so Christopher Gadsden, the designer of this flag, didn't seem to think that uh, liberty, in this case, um, uh, meant a lack of, of public health restrictions. Indeed, uh, for him, uh, it was public health that helped guarantee liberty, right, protected from disease. And um, important to uh, note, and this is a, a part of the book, nobody in 1776, in the American Revolution, protested against public health laws in the ways that we see currently, calling it a violation of freedom or a violation of, 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 of liberty. Um, it, didn't, it didn't exist. Now, sometimes people were angry about a quarantine. They might be upset that their ship got searched or um, something like that, uh, but there were not mass protests and, and this is despite the fact that the American Revolution took place during a smallpox epidemic. Uh, another city, Boston, Massachusetts, at the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, Boston had a 
general shutdown for inoculation. July 1776, uh, the colonial government uh, in, well, in uh, Boston, effectively independent at this point, uh, voted to close the entire city for several months in order for the citizenry to inoculate against smallpox. Uh, they provided for the poor. The entire city was part of it. People came from out of town to go into Boston to be inoculated. Abigail Adams and her children did this. Um, a woman, uh, Hannah Winthrop, wrote, men, women, and children eagerly crowding to inoculate is, I think, as modish, as, as stylish, as fashionable as running away from the troops of a barbarous King George. There was an editorial in, the, in a newspaper in Boston saying that inoculation cannot in any way more essentially serve this colony and the common cause of America. I think Bostonians uh, in 1776 understood what liberty meant. They were not waving their don't tread on me flags and invading Fainal Hall to stop the shutdown, right? They were embracing it as a symbol of, of, of progress, togetherness, defeating the disease was certainly a part of liberty to them. And of course, I, I mentioned George Washington's support. He was a, a reluctant supporter of, of broad inoculations, um, but became convinced, especially as cities across the colonies, as, as citizens, as soldiers, as his medical directors kept on encouraging him, telling him that mass inoculation was possible and popular. He ordered it. Uh, John Adams, the second president of the United States, thought there ought to be a public inoculating hospital in every uh, town in, in New England. Washington, after seeing the success of his inoculation program, wrote that he thought that every family, the head of every family, should be compelled uh, un under penalty of law to have their children uh, inoculated. This became a, a, uh, a, a popular position, even if it wasn't enshrined in, in, into law at the, at the time. And I think I'll, I'll come back to that idea of liberty um, that's in my title and that I'm contesting with the, these protesters in, in, in Lansing, right? The anti-mask, anti-shutdown protesters um, and, and re-emphasize that during the American Revolution, liberty uh, was not an individual right, but a, but a collective aim um, it was a duty of government, um, uh, it's written by John Locke in his second treatise of government, that, you, that government should preserve not only themselves, but their neighbors and the rest of mankind. Uh, there was a, a, a preacher in uh, colonial Connecticut that I think put it particularly well. He said, liberty is not doing as we please. It's not a freedom from all law and from all government. Now, liberty, is the freedom to act for the general good without incurring the displeasure of the ruler or of the censure of law. Um, the governor of Massachusetts later on in 1810 says the public health is undo undoubtedly the first duty of humanity and patriotism and that nothing is more pleasant than preserving the lives and health of our fellow citizens. So, if we want to protest public health laws, right? Uh, if we if we do that, we can't. It shouldn't. Uh, it will still happen, whether or not I, I say so in a, in a webinar in twenty twenty three. But but nevertheless, uh, invoking the founders just doesn't doesn't make sense, right? These were champions of public health that certainly thought that governments should do their utmost. They didn't always act correctly, but certainly should do their utmost in times of catastrophe to protect the lives of uh, citizens. And so that's uh, the book and the presentation. I'm happy to, to answer some, some questions later on. There's a lot to it. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Weirman. Dr. Barnes. Okay. Um... Thank you. Um, thanks to the LePage Center. Thanks to everyone involved in making this happen. And um, thanks to the folks who are tuning in on Zoom. And um, yeah, I'm um, 
I'm looking forward to discussing uh, Cindy's and Andy's presentations and the sort of overlaps with my own research. Um, let me start by telling you a little bit about um, about the Lazaretto. Um, there's the book. Um, so the book published earlier this year, as Julia said, um, explores how a particular kind of quarantine, which was a desperate last ditch response to an existential crisis, became an unpleasant and unpopular, but generally accepted urban institution in the 19th century. We're talking here about maritime quarantine, the systematic inspection and selective detention and disinfection away from the city of ships, cargo and passengers and sailors in order to prevent epidemic disease from being introduced into the city. The story of how this institution became ingrained and accepted, although unpopular, in Philadelphia begins in the 1790s with four devastating yellow fever epidemics in seven years, two of which each killed 10% of the city's population in a couple of months. As Julia mentioned, Philadelphia was the nation's capital in the 1790s, it was the nation's largest city, the nation's busiest seaport. It was the mecca of uh, culture, education, and science in the young United States. Some of you may be fans of Hamilton and the idea that New York City in the, in the 1770s was the greatest city in the world and so exciting. I'm sorry, I'm calling BS on that. New York was a backwater in the 1770s and even in the 1790s. Eventually, New York grew and became much more exciting. Um, Philadelphia was where it was at in the 1790s. Um, in the midst of these horrifyingly deadly outbreaks of yellow fever. Some, including Vice President Thomas Jefferson in 1798, doubted not only whether Philadelphia could continue to be the nation's capital, but also whether Philadelphia or indeed any part of the Atlantic seaboard of North America was habitable by large concentrations of people of European stock over the long term. The Lazaretto story also includes a bitter divide within the medical profession over yellow fevers, causes, transmission, and prevention. Um, this divide generally pitted those who believed yellow fever was contagious and imported from tropical climates aboard ships against those who insisted it was not contagious, but rather homegrown in accumulations of filth in hot and wet weather conditions. And each of those positions implied certain uh, certain policy stances with regard to the prevention of future yellow fever outbreaks. A decade long stalemate between these two sides paralyzed Philadelphia's new board of health and was finally broken thanks to a compromise engineered by the unlikeliest diplomat of all time and the single most odious human being I have ever had the displeasure of writing about. If you wanna know more about this individual, I willing to, willing to share more. Um, the Lazaretto story also includes an unregulated system of immigration to the United States in the late 18th and early 19th century, characterized by an organized system of human trafficking that systematically victimized vulnerable peasants through promises of, especially in uh, German speaking lands, um, that systematically victimized vulnerable peasants through promises of easy wealth and through um, confiscation of their belongings while piling them like sardines into filthy cargo holds with insufficient food and drink, generating deadly outbreaks of typhus also known as ship fever at the time, and then forcing them to indenture themselves after arrival in the US to pay for their passage. 
The story also includes an 1804 riot by passengers from the ship Rebecca who had survived a hellish eight week journey from Amsterdam only to have to sit in quarantine for another 48 days. When their frustration and rage finally boiled over, it caused $200 worth of damage to the Lazaretto, roughly $4,000 today. Incredibly, one survivor of this endless ordeal later praised the care he received in quarantine, saying, quote, no better attention could have been bestowed on me anywhere. The Lazaretto of today with the skyline of Philadelphia in the background. Um, the story also includes a yellow fever outbreak in Philadelphia in, in 1805 that the city's Board of Health blamed on an 11-year-old orphan boy named Tobias Smith, who allegedly sailed from the city to the Lazaretto, where he had contact with ships undergoing quarantine in violation of the state's health law, and then allegedly brought the disease back to the city with him. The story includes Thomas Jefferson Perkins Stokes, an ambitious young doctor who in 1853 allowed the bark Mandarin from uh, Stokes was the Lazaretto physician in 1853. He allowed the bark Mandarin from Cienfuegos in Cuba to proceed to the port of Philadelphia after a brief 24 hour quarantine and cursory disinfection. When yellow fever broke out in the neighborhood surrounding the wharf where the Mandarin was docked, Stokes and his quarantine master, Matthew Van Dusen, were indicted for dereliction of public duty, the only time such a charge was brought in the Lazaretto's history. The story also includes the quarantine station's darkest hour in 1870, when the botched handling of the brig home, which arrived from Jamaica, in filthy condition, having lost its captain to illness during the voyage, spread yellow fever throughout the Lazaretto itself, killing the Lazaretto physician, the quarantine master, the matron, the head nurse, and 27 others at the station and in the city. Perhaps the most surprising twist in the Lazaretto story is the fate of the thousands of immigrants and sailors who arrived at the station seriously ill with yellow fever or typhus, two diseases which were often fatal and which by any reasonable definition would have been considered incurable before antibiotics, and one of which, yellow fever, is still essentially incurable today. What happened to these thousands of uh, immigrants and sailors who were seriously ill? Um, they survived. 88% of them, uh, at least during the years for which we have records. So what miracle cure were they given at the Lazaretto Hospital? Um, buy the book and find out. Um, I may, okay, I may tell you during the Q&A if you're interested. Um, how's that for a teaser? Okay, the story um, of the Lazaretto, unfortunately, includes innumerable examples of non-existent, ineffective, or just plain bad public health leadership. And it includes at least one example of courageous, calm, competent, and politically savvy leadership in the person of William T. Robinson, Lazaretto physician from 1878 to 1883 who skillfully reassured the Board of Health and the general public while navigating around a dangerous yellow fever crisis uh, in 1879, which threatened to become a repeat of the 1870 disaster, all while fending off unfounded accusations and rumors about lax security at the Lazaretto. I think today's public health officials could learn a thing or two from Dr. Robinson. And finally, the Lazaretto story includes its afterlives, um, including, let me go back to this one. Um, yeah, um, including its time as a country club and summer refuge for Philadelphia's elite, its long service as a flight school and seaplane base, 
through most of the 20th century and its recent restoration and preservation after a developer threatened to demolish it in order to build an airport parking garage in its place. I hope uh, some of you, uh, as Julia said, will come visit this unusual and remarkable historic site, enjoy the um, exhibits that we're working on and audio tours, et cetera. I'll stop there now and um, happy to discuss this uh, in greater depth um, during our general discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Bynes. I think this was a fantastic uh, survey of the history of epidemics moving from Provence over to uh, the colonies and rebellion and then settling in Philadelphia and also moving to the different layers of society that are swept up by epidemics. <clears throat> Dr. Ermos gave us a political perspective that emphasized the central government's role. Then Dr. Weyman took us down to the street level and also intermediate levels of public health with officials like uh, Christopher Gadsden in South Carolina monitoring on a weekly basis inoculation. And then Dr. Barnes took us to the Lazaretto itself, that frontline defense against epidemics and gave us these poignant stories of many individuals some of whom are merely passing through the Lazaretto, others of whom would lose their lives there, and all of whom were affected by new public health legislation. So it really gives a, a fantastic overview of the history of epidemics and public health. I'm curious if you guys have any questions for each other. I wanted to um, add a um, a comment to, or a, or a kind of complementary dimension to um, Dr. Wehrman's um, perspective on liberty. And I found a passage um, in my book where um, the English moral philosopher, William Paley um, is discussing the paradox of liberty. And um, Paley used the example of quarantine, which is, you know, clearly by definition, the temporary, um, you know, deprivation of liberty for public health purposes as um, the classic case study in the paradox of liberty. So the example he gave in, involved a passenger detained on, so this is overlapping with uh, Dr. Aramis's work as well, a passenger detained on returning to England from the Middle East where bubonic plague outbreaks were common, the quarantined Englishman might resent his detention, Paley argued, but he would hardly accuse government of encroaching upon his civil freedom. On the contrary, he might even congratulate himself that he had at length set his foot again in a land of liberty. So essentially this temporary denial of liberty was the essential guarantor of liberty in Paley's view. And um, he described the, the sort of the key to the paradox as the, what he called the manifest expediency of quarantine. Because if, so if quarantine were not effective in preventing or mitigating epidemics, then of course the deprivation of liberty would have no purpose. And, um, but because it was, um, and he argued most people understood that it had this purpose, even though they disliked or even resented the experience of quarantine, they understood its purpose and um, as a guarantor of liberty. That's that's wonderful, though. No, that I wish I had written that and included it in my own book. No, it's but it's very clear that that is a. Uh, uh, a common perception of of liberty during the revolution and it is kind of a, it is a, a paradox certainly um to have quarantines um like this there was another writer or a doctor that i talk about in in my book from rhode island rhode island had these extremely strict quarantine laws where they if, if you were sick the the uh city council would send a uh 
almost like a coffin to to your your house they load the person in it and then they carry this box with with a infectious person across uh the 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 harbor to to an island to isolate them and and uh he 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 wrote to a to a friend in, in england and you would think that of all people americans would say this was a violation of liberty uh but he says but they don't <laughs> appreciate it. he didn't explain it you know as eloquently as the as as paley did but uh it was still a a, a remarkable thing that um they got it now there's that that key that you mentioned is is knowing that it worked and i think that was what made yellow fever so different was that it was so controversial and people arguing that that maybe it it was uh ineffective or or, or didn't work certainly smallpox was was pretty easy to keep keep contained, but yellow fever wasn't. Dr. Ermus, I'm curious if you see language of liberty also coming up in your sources, whether you're looking at France or Spain or another European country, do you see government officials justifying quarantine in these terms or are they using different kinds of language or different political objectives to justify their public health interventions? Thank you, thank you for the question. So yes. Absolutely. And the biggest uh, chapter here uh, for this question would be chapter uh, three on London in the case of uh, of London, where the language of of despotism and tyranny and violations of liberty came up from the ground up, uh, basically accusations that the crown was imposing these unnecessary quarantines uh, just you know, in violation of the rights of the people, that they were trying to imitate despotic France is a phrase mm. that came up a lot, right? Um, they were trying to act like the French, like the despotic king of France, you know, the absolutist king. And um, so what we see in the unique case of London is that the protests were such from not only individuals, but also from like the grocers of London, for example, and you know, like individual groups, that eventually the uh, like within months the uh, the uh, Quarantine Act of 1720, there it was kind of replicating the 1710 Quarantine Act with some updates uh, for the 1720 plague. Uh, they had to scratch it. They they kind of said, okay, you know what? Maybe we don't need a quarantine. The plague is still in France, and and it ends up being. Uh, a, a very like a more short lived uh, than it was these these plague regulations that is more short lived than they were in Italy or in Spain, for example, or even in Portugal, which I haven't mentioned yet. But so it's an interesting case. It's kind of the it's kind of closer to what we're saying was not the case, right? In uh, in Andrew's book, for example, to where these are people who were I mean they're not complaining masking, for example. Um, but they're complaining against quarantine in particular, against isolation, uh, against uh, these these practices as violations of their liberty, which is interesting. But we don't see any of that in Spain, hmm. right? We don't see any of that in Italy. Uh, and I don't even see much of that in France, although France is where the infection was. So that would be a good reason for that. Yeah. And And so it's just an interesting contrast. This was in the wake of the Glorious Revolution. This was within, you know. 40 years or 30 years. So just an interesting, uh, different case. So in those other countries where you don't see criticism of quarantine, how is quarantine justified? Are people appealing to this idea of a social contract, that this is necessary uh, sacrifice of individuals to collect the greater good? Do you see an economic argument that this is absolutely necessary for economic stability? Do you see humanitarian argument? What is the argument that's being made to defend public health measures? Depends on where you look. It's a lot of different. Uh, it depends on specifically what the case is. In the case of Spain, for example, um, there was a town called Murcia, or there is a town called Murcia. It's still there, of course, and um, and it was the panic of the fear of plague mm. was such that the local town built up their own plague wall. They enclosed themselves in in a in a in a new wall to keep outsiders out, but the people inside were also worried that if they needed to get out, they wouldn't be able to. So there would be people waiting in lines from dusk until dawn, as they put it, you know, trying to get their health passports in case they needed to travel and all these kinds of things. So there was, 
it was seen uh, in some cases as a need. You, we do need these protections. And mm -hmm. so there weren't protests in those cases, but but then at the same time, there were letters in terms, you mentioned the, you know, the question of economics and, and uh, of financial li of livelihoods and everything. Um, because there was such a clamping down on certain uh, kinds of trade and 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 practices and the creation of silkworms. The creation of silkworms was apparently a very stinky endeavor. And so you can't have anything uh, too stinky in times of plague because it'd be considered, you know, liable to spread the plague because of the uh, plague. These are the side this concept of miasmas, right? Uh, the reminds me of David's uh, second book. And um, uh, so, so in those cases, people's livelihoods were suffering and there would be letters, petitions, you know, to the king that I came across saying, you know, our industry is suffering. Well, you know, my family is hungry. Can we please start allowing the, uh, the keeping of silkworms again or whatever the case may be, the keeping of bulls, the keeping of pigs and styes and things like that. So they were more like a kind of individual letters going in on a case by case basis rather than a movement of protest or anything like that. It seems like outside of, for example, London, the example I gave, uh, it was seen more as a need, like a sacrifice, uh, as you put it. People sacrificing, I guess, personal liberties to protect themselves. Uh, it could also be that, you know, the memory of plague is different depending on where you look. And perhaps uh, in London, it had already been forgotten. The last major plague there was the one in 1665 or 66, no, 65. The fire and the plague came close together, I forget which is which, but um, whereas in Spain, it had been a little bit more recent, right? It was in the 1680s, I believe. I'd have to confirm that, but I'm not sure what the explanation is. Well, speaking on the, on the topic of how memory influences our current experiences and how our experiences can also affect our memory, I'm curious how living through the COVID-19 pandemic affected each of you, both in how your understanding of history affected your reaction to that experience. Dr. Weirman has already pointed out that you paid attention to different aspects of the discourse around uh, masking isolation because of your understanding of inoculation um, in the past. But I'm curious for the rest of you, if there were particular aspects of that experience that stood out to you because of your stark knowledge. And then conversely, for all of you, did your experience of living through a pandemic change your understanding of how people in the past reacted to and understood these experiences? If I may, one thing uh, that I definitely that came to mind when uh, when I thought was thinking about this question is how much more forgiving I was with my research, so to speak, in the process of finishing up the book uh, after COVID began. There were so many questions that I had uh in terms of specifics like how many people you know how, well, well how many people actually caught this how far did it get how many people died and it's hard to get at those numbers and it turns out after you know with my experience in COVID one of the third first things I realized is that you can't actually you can't really get exact numbers of cases or deaths even as it's ongoing it's so incredibly complex and difficult and there's just a lot of information that you just can't get at, and you're never going to have the, uh, you know, anything close to a precise answer. And that's okay because even while it's happening, it turns out it's hard to, 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 to get accurate information, you know. And it could be for a number of reasons. In the case of COVID, all, so many people who died in its earliest weeks and months died of, you know, pneumonia, maybe associated with flu or something. It turns out that it was COVID, and we didn't know. Um, record keeping, politics. Censorship is just a number of, of things that go into it. So that was one thing that came to mind. Yeah, I think my um, all of my research and teaching have conditioned me to always look for um, socioeconomic inequality in every public health question. And um, COVID was no different. And um, so I actually, um, I found the, the whole experience was very humbling. I, you know, when, when we first heard about this new disease, this new virus, I told all my friends and colleagues and family members confidently, you know, that 
this is gonna this is gonna come to the US. Lots of people are gonna get it, lots of people are gonna die. And a year from now we'll look back and um roughly the same number of people will have died in 2020 than it, as in 2019, 2018, 2017. Um, because it'll be like flu, essentially, people who have people who are elderly and have weakened immune systems will die of this instead of the flu, instead of other things. Um, so that was spectacularly wrong. Um, but and part of the reason it was wrong is because I actually, despite all my experience and my many years of being a sentient citizen of this country, underestimated the extreme degree of inequality um, in this country and how deadly it can be. So um, I'm not saying that every, the entire question of COVID boils down to inequality, but it is the, um, it's the elephant in the room, I think, and helps explain why the US did poorly relative to other rich countries. Um, so I actually understood and had some sympathy for people who were pushing back against COVID restrictions because in their worlds, in their lives, they didn't see it. They honestly, they didn't have people in their neighborhoods, in their families who were getting seriously ill or dying of COVID. And so they, you know, heard about this on the news. They saw, you know, maybe they're, they lost their job or they, their lives were severely inconvenienced and they didn't see the impact because they live in a different world from the world where people were dying of COVID. And I, um, I honestly couldn't blame them from, for um, being upset. Um, so yeah, it has, in so many ways, it's been humbling and it's changed my teaching. Um, and I've, I've doubled down on some things and I've abandoned some other things. Um, what when it, I just wish we didn't have to go through that in order to learn these lessons. Yeah. It's interesting to, I mean, I have some of the same feelings. Sometimes I describe it um, initially um, as it, it felt like I was, you know, if you watch like a, a Netflix series or something and, and, you're you're a few seasons in and you convince somebody else to 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 watch it and they're just starting like I was ahead I knew that it was going to be worse that that this was going to last a long time that it was going to affect the U.S. that it's going to throw uh uh pol you know it, it hit at such a terrible time where you know when when ec when epidemics tend to be handled well it's when um uh populations trust their government and in 2020, when this was was hit at the you know the same time that D Donald Trump was under impeachment, um, it was a profound time of distrust in in government, and it you could just tell that this was going to be uh, awful and partisan and split and and, and divided, and, and of course um, social economically as well. You know, as soon as um, reports started and this uh, uh, coming that. It, here in Michigan, that the disease, the deaths were uh, disproportionately affecting Black people in Detroit is when these predominantly white protesters from rural parts of Michigan uh, were protesting against these uh, quarantine restrictions. So, I mean, some of that was, um, you know, uh, completely unpredictable how, how the events transpired, but the, but the, anger and divisiveness was certainly there um, and it uh, made me think about my book a little bit um, and that is especially in how people follow the news of epidemics um, they're following case numbers infection numbers they during an epidemic people pay attention to what their government is doing uh, what the, may, maybe for the first time uh, they're, I think, more susceptible to, to misinformation. We see that in the American Revolution as in 2020, because people want to know what's happening. Um, and, and that can lead them in uh, very good directions. I think there are lots of Americans, you know, before the, the pandemic didn't know what an epidemiologist was, and, and certainly they, they do now. Um, 
And, and conversely, we, we have lots of misinformation about vaccines and, and different things that get spread because of it. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, eventually th this, as a, as a historian who, who, who wrote about it, um, especially in, in the real throes of the pandemic in, in 2020, it, it was um, uh, very distressing and sometimes de depressing to be working on on this topic um and then kind of heartening when the first vaccines rolled out and you saw people getting nurses getting vaccinated in new york and and that kind of stuff and it was uh it it, it wasn't uh something that I, I i thought would happen of course when i was doing the research for this book that it would become so uh emotional in in the process but it's certainly part of the experience of of, of it for me Mm -hmm. Well, I've also done my own studies on the history of public health, and I found that for me, um, one thing I noticed in the middle of the pandemic was there was a subtle but significant shift in the public health messaging, which I was able to understand as a historian in the shifting of responsibility, where initially people were advised to mask to protect themselves from infection and even in very early days of the pandemic, we were advised not to buy masks in order to make sure there were enough masks for those who were on the front lines. But later, the messaging around masking changed and people were advised to mask in order to avoid being an unwitting carrier of the disease because we learned that people could be asymptomatic carriers, never showing any signs of infection and yet being able to transmit COVID-19 to other people. And that made me empathize with people who had to go through quarantine believing themselves to be healthy and not a carrier of plague or other infectious diseases, and yet having to go through this ritual in order to protect the community. And so every time I put on my mask, I thought of, okay, this is my version of doing a small gesture, even though I think I'm perfectly healthy, yet I could be the unwitting carry carrier, the type of person who in the past would be put into quarantine for the benefit of the community. Um, and I thought that shift in messaging was really important that we're taking things, we are um, doing these measures not to protect ourselves, but lest we become the vector for others. But I would also echo um, Dr. Barnes' point that due to socioeconomic differences, experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic varied widely. Some of the most vivid images for the pandemic for me were waiting in long lines for the supermarket and the disruptions in um, how we shopped. For me, that's some of the most vivid memories. And of course, other people have other vivid memories, but essentially our experiences are very fragmented based on how the disease entered our lives. So as a historian, that's just a reminder of how hard it is to actually create an accurate and comprehensive picture of an epidemic when you're piecing together these fragments of people who all have very different experiences of such an event. And our and and our uh, perspectives on you know past epidemics are colored by the people who actually um, you know who kept written records and whose mm -hmm. written records were preserved, and uh, you know essentially a tiny slice of the population. Absolutely. I'm wondering if it's possible for us to expand outward from discussion of pandemics to other kinds of disasters. I pose this question knowing that Dr. Ormos has written both about uh, disease epidemics and about other disasters. And so I'll invite you first to comment on whether there are parallels in the way governments manage other disasters, if there are lessons learned from managing pandemics that you see translated to other disasters or that should be translated to managing other disasters. And then I'll invite everyone else to comment on, um, is there something unique about managing an epidemic, is an epidemic a unique kind of disaster, or are there similarities across all disasters here? I'm thinking particularly of um, what we might think of as natural disasters, which of course also have a strong human component to them. Sure, thank you. Um, so to your first question, I think should be is the way, is how I would answer it. I think that the way that we uh, manage public health crises should be more of a model for the way that we handle 
disasters um, in some ways. I am encouraged. I just finished teaching uh, the history of epidemics this semester. Today was our last day of formal lecture discussion. And we were just uh, talking about this today, interestingly, and on Tuesday, about how we were able to end the semester on a somewhat very cautiously um, positive note. Right, we talked on Tuesday about emerging infectious diseases like SARS and H5N1 and that kind of thing, and about how SARS was a sort of uh, a good practice run, you know, the first new disease of the 21st century for what was to come. Right, hindsight, everything is always clear, of course. So, you know, by the time COVID comes around, we see now that some of the mechanisms that were put in place to uh, in the time of SARS in the beginning. Uh, I guess 2003 to 2004 uh, were integral or would be integral years later in, you know, in terms of the coming together of laboratories, the linking of laboratories across the globe in order to, to clamp down on this thing immediately as quickly as possible and we find out what, you know, what's responsible for it, what the pathogen was uh, and creating a, a vaccine and treatments and all these kinds of things. It happened with record speed for that time. And I think that fast forward to uh, COVID, we can be encouraged by the fact that I'm still in awe of how quickly we were able to uh, come up with these different vaccines. Uh, I, I, I think it's, it, we shouldn't take that for granted. Um, and so that sort of cooperation, that sort of global cooperation, I know it's not perfect, and I know there are a lot of gaps and there are a lot of problems, to, to say the very least, but I think that the kind of cooperation that we have been able to achieve in times of public health crisis in recent decades is, is in, in recent, in the last couple of decades in particular, um, is encouraging. And if, the, if, if disaster response, if it was anything like that for something like uh, climate change, for example, which I think we have a lot more work to do, or for the kind of disasters that are, you know, more frequent because of climate change, or even just, uh, you know, hurricanes or earthquakes when they occur, or like flood-prone areas. Um, I think that it would be, uh, I think that our responses would go a much longer way. Instead, what we see is that, that they're fragmented, they're so fragmented, and um, we basically make the same mistakes over and over again in a lot of ways. Uh, when you look at other types of disasters. And so to your second question, I would say that public health crises are unique and they are certainly a, a kind of disaster. I, I wouldn't argue otherwise, but they are unique in some ways. And that's one of the ways in terms of how we manage them and also in terms of how we perceive them. I kind of consider uh, disease epidemics like the, you know, the first horsemen or whatever, the uh, of the apocalypse, you know, the, the uber disaster, <laughs> the most fear disaster, the invisible killer that you can't see and that, you know, um, can create panic unlike any other kind of disaster that 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 I, I look at. So um, so I, I yeah, that's all to say that I think that the way that we handle public health crises uh, is more effective and efficient if you compare, if you come down to that, than how we handle uh, the increasingly frequent kind of so-called natural disasters, right? Natural uh, extreme events that we see increasing with uh, climate change. Dr. Barnes or Dr. Roman, do you wanna add to that? Well, I like that it was a positive kind of thing. I don't know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll rain on the comment. So uh, it made me think of, I, I think there, a, a potential problem in, in, in linking these things um, is doing like uh, somebody that I wish I could have written a little bit more about in my in my book, Noah Webster, the, the dictionary mm -hmm. guy. Later on, he wrote a book on epidemiology and it was in, in an attempt to explain yellow fever in, in Philadelphia, really. And he linked epidemics and natural disasters together and says that you know earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes as well as epidemics are all products of the same thing it's a disordered atmosphere there's something going on in the electromagnetism of the planet and webster's uh response is basically that humans can't do anything to stop it right um look at what happened in yellow fever. We tried quarantines. It really didn't work. A bunch of people still died. We can't stop earthquakes. We can't stop volcanoes. Um, and, and it's this terrible depressing. This is like the first 
um, uh, sometimes because they were like the first uh, book on of epidemiology written in in the United States. Um, and it's it's terribly depressing. I mean, he what basically what Webster's trying to do is trying to keep keep businesses open and keep the economy thriving and, and shut down quarantines and things. But uh, effectively, what, what he's saying is that um, uh, epidemics and, and other kinds of natural disasters are the same. And humans have proven that they're bad at handling them. Now, I hope <laughs> with vaccines, we can prove Noah Webster wrong. Obviously, they're they're not linked in that same way that a volcano in in Italy predicts an epidemic in China or something the way Webster thought it could. So, um, I'll see your pessimism and raise you. Um, <laughs> I um, I agree with Cindy in that um, epidemics do inspire a um, a unique kind of fear. Um, but I do think there is a lot of overlap with um, so-called natural disasters in the sense of um, differential impact. And um, when I, I, like you, Cindy, I, um, I'm currently teaching a history of epidemics class. And the very first thing I have students read is Eric Kleinenberg's book, Heat Wave, about 1995 right. heat wave in Chicago. It's not an epidemic, but it's a template for studying epidemics. It um, The subtitle is A Social Autopsy of Natural Disaster. And social autopsy is essentially the way, the best way to understand, um, you know, after the fact, obviously, these disasters, including epidemics. And Rudolf Virchow said um, uh, in the, in the mid-19th century, Epidemics resemble great warning signs on which um, we can essentially read, uh, we can see that society has been disordered, I think was his word. Um, and so, so epidemics and other kinds of disasters are like social x-rays. We can see it's, it's not that they, of course they do cause damage, but um, in addition to causing damage, they're revealing pre-existing damage. They're revealing the fractures in our society that um, already existed. And um, that's where I think we've generally failed pretty miserably in learning lessons of epidemics. We just hope that like, you know, the vaccines will be better next time. And um, yeah, the, vac the vaccines, there will always be another pathogen out there to kill the vulnerable people or to, you know, sicken the vulnerable vulnerable people. And of course, COVID is a great illustration of how vaccines can be complete game changers, but we can't vaccinate our way to healthier populations. We, we never have, and uh, we won't be able to in the future. We can try to um, make the vulnerable populations less vulnerable with enlightened um, social policy. Um, so that, yeah, that's why I, I assigned that particular book um, for the history of epidemics. And um, yeah, I'd love to see more histories of epidemics uh, that resemble that kind of social autopsy method. Mm, that's quite a vivid image, the autopsy or the x-ray of society. Yeah. As you mentioned, it's every disaster, whether it's an epidemic or another kind of disaster, is an x-ray of society, but also as Dr. Weir would point out, allows us to reevaluate our understanding of the relationship between citizens and their governments and between citizens and a larger community. We have to always question where those obligations lie at the level of government and the level of the individual citizen and the community. And Dr. Ermes's work also shows how deep the roots are in understanding what the government's role is in managing disasters. So I'm afraid we have to wrap up our conversation right now because we've come to the end of our time, but I am so grateful that you've joined me here and I've learned so much from you. Um, I look forward to continuing this conversation in other times and other places. So I wish you all the best and have a good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much. A real pleasure. Such a such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Truly. Thank you. Uh, honor to be here and nice to, to, to meet you all and see you virtually. Hopefully you can do it in person at some point. That'd be I do hope so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Goodbye.